you would like to rename yourself with your pronouns and your organization, feel free to do that, although it is not required. Good afternoon, folks. Hi, this is Sarah Glidden. I am Program Manager for the Cultural Investment Portfolio at the Mass Cultural Council. Um, I'm going to be doing the presentation today about our Projects Grant Program. You can probably see that we do have the live transcript enabled for this program. So you can follow along by reading the captions. Um, you do need to enable that on your own computer to show them. You'll also notice that we have not enabled the chat function today. We are using the Q&A function for you to ask questions. And we will be answering some of those questions live and some of those questions will actually be answered in the Q&A. You can make your questions private or anonymous uh, or you can make them shared with everybody else who's reading the Q&A. And either one is fine by us. Use whatever feels appropriate to you. I'm joined today by two of my colleagues, Cheyenne Cohn Postel, who is a program officer, who is now our diversity and equity initiatives program officer. She's also working with the gaming program and has been a member of the CIP team for the last year and a half. And my colleague, Michael Ibrahims, program manager for the cultural investment portfolio. And he works with many of our service activities that you might've participated in the past. And like I said, he will be assisting, both of them will be assisting with questions from you and some of them they just might read out loud to me so I can respond to them in the moment. Just to let you know, we are recording this session today, so the recording will be posted on our website within a day or so. So our agenda for today, talking about the cultural investment portfolio and giving you a very brief overview of that, and then going into the projects program. I'm going to start by highlighting a couple of major changes to the projects grant program for fiscal 22. And then I'm going to go into organization eligibility, project eligibility, the application and review process, and tips and suggestions on how to be most successful in this program. Just a notice for you that this information is a supplement to the published guidelines for the grant program and is not a substitute for them. So we're certainly hoping that we add lots of value today, but it's not a standalone experience. So the portfolio. The portfolio is, well, CIP, the Cultural Investment Portfolio, is the name that we give to our operating support programs at Mass Cultural Council. Mass Cultural Council is a state agency that supports the arts, humanities, and interpretive sciences. The CIP program includes three distinct grant activities. We have our portfolio grantees, that's 313 organizations that are receiving ongoing unrestricted operating support grants, and those grants range from $5,000 to $60,000. We have 32 gateway grantees. Those are organizations that are on the pathway to becoming part of the portfolio. Those organizations are receiving fiscal 22 grants for $4,000. And then there's this program, the project grantees. Project grants are $2,500. And I have the TBD there because we don't know exactly how many we are awarding yet. Um, we also have a variety of services, workshops, seminars, other programs that support the cultural sector. And in fiscal 22, we will be awarding about just under $6.8 million in grants. Just to let you know, if you receive, if your organization is receiving a gateway grant or a portfolio grant in this year, in fiscal 22, you are not eligible to apply to the projects program. If you are hoping that you can be in the portfolio at some future time, you may certainly apply to the project program for this year because this is not establishing anything about your eligibility for future applications. 
So a few major changes. And the most significant change is the change to the application system. We have a brand new application system. If you've applied in the past on our GoSmart system, um, you know that that's, uh, I've been telling folks for a couple of years that that was gonna go away. If you've been applying to the local cultural council programs, you've been applying on the Smart Simple program in the past. This year we have merged all of those programs. And so any old usernames and passwords are not going to be relevant. Um, this is a, a, all part of a consolidation of our activities so that we can have one location for all of your online engagement with Mass Cultural Council. It replaces all the other programs we've used except for the data arts program, which does continue. Um, we've also been working on a lot of activities around reflecting a deeper concern and deeper awareness of equity issues in philanthropy. So we have been working very hard to streamline and simplify application and reporting processes, and also looking at broadening eligibility in ways that um, are fair and relevant and equitable to the field. We're very conscious of the amount of labor that gets put into applying for grants and understanding grant guidelines. And we're really trying to make a lot of that a little simpler for all of our applicants. So here we are today talking about the Pro Projects Grant Program. These are grants that are support for a specific project, not for general operating support. So you're going to pick some particular activity of what you are doing, and that will be the subject of your application. It is a $2,500 grant. So if you have ever spent time agonizing over how much to ask for, that is not an issue here. It is $2,500 and you don't have to worry about more or less. An organization may apply annually. So having received a projects grant in the past does not make you eligible or ineligible for this year. Each year is a separate application process. This is an application for organizational support. So if you do not have an organization, you may not apply. An individual artist is not eligible for this particular grant program. And all of the applications are due on November 16th, 2021 at 1159 59 p.m. At that time, the application program will close down and you will not be able to submit any application that you are working on. And I'm sorry, but there really isn't an appeal process to that. We need to be um, fair to all of the organizations that are applying and folks who decide they can't finish an application and decide not to do it. That might have done it if we could allow exceptions to the rule. That's not going to be an issue. So 1159, 59 p.m. on November 16th. So who can apply for a project's grant? Well, first of all, Massachusetts recognized 501c3 organizations. So you have to be Massachusetts recognized. You might have been founded in another state, but you have registered with the Commonwealth of Massachusetts as a foreign corporation that makes you eligible. You have to have Massachusetts recognition. These can be fully cultural or not fully cultural organizations. And when we talk about an organization being fully cultural, we mean that their primary mission is about access, education, excellence or diversity in the arts, humanities or interpretive sciences. In this program, we get a fair number of applications from organizations that are not what we would consider fully cultural. For example, boys and girls clubs, um, social service organizations, other youth activities, but these are organizations that have a cultural programming component and it's that cultural programming that you can apply for support for, for this grant program. You can be an agency or department under federal, state, or local government. So a local cultural council that does its own programming can apply. Uh, parks and recreation departments of municipalities, senior service organizations that are parts of municipalities, all of those organizations would be eligible to apply as agencies or departments under a local government. Unlike many grant programs for organizations, you may apply to this program if you are using a fiscal agent. You still have to be either an unincorporated organization that is 
that has a nonprofit purpose, or you can be an organization that has incorporated, but you don't have your 501c3 yet. In either case, you do have to have a third party eligible organization to be a fiscal agent for you. If you are awarded a grant, our contract will be with that fiscal agent and then they will pass the funds to you. They have some particular responsibilities about how they oversee those funds on your behalf. And frequently there is a charge to your organization for an organization to act as a fiscal agent for you. Also a question we get pretty frequently is, can an organization that is receiving other grants from Mass Cultural Council act as a fiscal agent for you? And yes, they can. But what I do wanna point out here is that there are some organizations that, are, that will act as fiscal agents for LLCs or for for-profit corporations. Those organizations are still not eligible to apply. So you st still have to have a nonprofit objective. As I mentioned before, if you are currently receiving a fiscal 22 grant under either the portfolio or gateway program, you're not eligible to apply to this program. And you can't apply to this program if you're an individual as opposed to being part of an organization. Finally, as an eligibility requirement, you do have to have past cultural programming in Massachusetts prior to this application. And this is one of the places where we have adjusted the eligibility requirements. It used to be that you had to have two years of public cultural programming in Massachusetts to be eligible. We have reduced that simply to having any public cultural programming experience in Massachusetts. And I'm going to get into where that impacts your application in just a moment. So what I just talked about was your organization being eligible. What I'm talking about now is the project that your organization is doing and its eligibility. First of all, this programming in this very strange time that we are in can be in-person programming, it can be virtual programming, it can be streaming, or it can be a combination of those. We know that folks have had incredible flexibility over the last year and a half about how they connect with their public. And we are looking at continuing to be as supportive of that as possible. Your project budget has to have a minimum of $2,500 of cash expenses. That's another change from the past. In the past, we'd had a $5,000 minimum of which we would fund half of it, the $2,500. We have reduced that. So now there's no one-to-one -one match. You don't have to prove you've got funds from other um, resources if your project is only a $2,500 project. Next one is something that trips people up a little bit. So, so note this one. The project and its expenses must take place between June 1st of 2021 and June 30th of 2022. Basically, this is our fiscal year, which is a July 1st to June 30th fiscal year, plus the month of June, because we know that otherwise summer programs have a great difficulty in applying to this project's grant program um, with a project that straddles fiscal years. Note that we are saying that you can look backwards to a project that has already been completed and you can apply for that project. And just because I know that there's some concern that a project that has already been completed might be more or less competitive than a project that hasn't happened yet, all of those projects are looked at with the same lens. In the review of the applications, the panelists, and I'll get into the panelists in a moment, the panelists will be instructed that there is no preferential treatment for something that has already happened or something that has not already happened. Our goal is to support cultural activity across the Commonwealth in this fiscal year. And we want everyone to be on an equal footing for that. There are two kinds of projects in this program and you, most of you as applicants can choose which kind of project you want to apply for. We call those public programming or capacity building. And the capacity building grants are only for organizations that are fully cultural. So if you are one of those social service organizations, um, 
this is not going to be something you can choose. You can only choose the public programming. But if you are a fully cultural organization, you might choose that a capacity building project is really the better fit for your current needs. And I'm going to get into both of those in a little more detail in just a second. Just a, a heads up, we have a lot of programs running right now. And I know there's been a little confusion about this. So I wanna be really uh, clear about it that you may also apply to local cultural councils for the exact same project or for a different project that your organization is doing. And the application deadline for the local cultural councils is October 15th. You might also be in the process of applying to the Mass Cultural Council's festivals program. And that is also fine. You may apply to both festivals program and to the projects program. But any individual festival will receive a maximum grant of $2,500. The festival's deadline is November 3rd. So let me just clarify that a little bit. Festival's grants are a flat amount of $1,500. And right now the applications are for fall winter festivals. If you apply for and receive a festival's grant of $1,500 and also apply to the projects program for the exact same festival, we will consider you eligible for a $1,000 grant, bringing you up to a total of $2,500 across the festivals program and the projects program. You might say, why should I bother applying to both of those? Well, they are being reviewed separately with different criteria. And in the past, we've been able to fund almost all of the festivals applications. So you might see that as a little bit more of um, a sure, if not a sure thing, at least a more likely outcome. So that might be a way to cover your bases and to um, apply for the maximum possible. Um, if you are an organization that does a variety of programming, including a festival, you could apply to the festivals program for the festival and apply to the projects program for some other activity that you are doing. And those will be reviewed completely separately. There will not be any um, overlap or implications from one program to the other if you are applying to separate programs. Since all of our applications are now in the same system, we'll be able to see very easily who has applied to both programs and who has been funded by the festivals program. Sarah? Yeah. Uh, if you actually want to go back to the last slide, we do have a question uh, about other mass cultural programs, but it's actually Gateway okay. and the relationships between projects and FY22 Gateway. Sure. The grant awards for fiscal 22 for the Gateway program have already been determined. The organizations that receive fiscal 21 grants get a second, it's a two year grant program. So they are already awarded for fiscal 22. So, and if you know that your organization received a grant last year, you should be pretty confident. In fact, you should be entirely confident that your organization is receiving a grant again this year, unless there was an eligibility concern for your second year of the grant. And announcements to the Gateway folks are going out in the next couple of days just to confirm that and to get them signed up into the new grant application system. If you're asking about Gateway because you want to apply for the future, typically that application would be happening in January for fiscal 23, fiscal 24 grants. So not for fiscal, you, it, it is not possible for you to apply for a fiscal 22 Gateway grant if you don't already have it. So there is really no potential for overlap or exclusion on that. Um, we and so that means that if somebody was going to apply for Gateway, but there is not a fiscal 22 cycle, then projects would be the best. Projects is the only, and even if, so we've already decided to postpone our fiscal. Typically we would have an application cycle for Gateway that would have an application deadline at the end of January. But that would be for next year's grants. And this program is for this year's grants. So even if we were still running it in January, there wouldn't be overlap because they are for different fiscal years of activity. 
And that's the key point here is when the activity is happening. Um, because of other work that we are doing internally, we have delayed the gateway application and I will keep people informed. You are on our email list, so you will get notifications about what happens next with Gateway. Does that help? Yes, thank you so much. Fabulous, thank you. Um, I know that's a little confusing because the whole fiscal year, calendar year thing um, doesn't match up to everybody else's fiscal year. So timeline, and also just to make it clear, that the gateway program is for getting into the portfolio. The projects program does not count towards the portfolio. It's just a really separate process. Our timeline for this program. Here we are today on October 6th doing an information webinar. The application deadline, as I've already said, November 16th, 2021, and that's at midnight, not at noon. Um, award notification, we are expecting that this will go out to you no later than the first week of January. A reminder that the project and its expenses must take place in this 13 month period of last June 1st to next June 30th. If you submit an application and the project is happening in next July or August, it will not be eligible. We are expecting that your contract, if you are awarded a grant, the contracts will be available before the end of January. You will be able to download that contract and mail it back to us because the state still requires that you send us a physical contract with what they call a wet signature. Payments are made typically within 45 days of receiving your signed contract in the mail. And then the final report is a very brief final report that is due June 30th of 2022. If you're somebody whose project is finalized, is finishing up on June 29th, we're not going to expect that you can get your final report done by June 30th. We can do an extension for that. But just a heads up, if you have not submitted your final report, you won't be eligible to apply for other Mass Cultural Council opportunities. So this, this again is one of those things that's coming out of us having one centralized place for all of your activities with us. You'll be able to log in and see that you have a final report that hasn't been completed and you have to get it done before you are even able to see the other application opportunities that exist. So I talked about um, the, what the project has to do as a bare minimum, the, the grant size, the budget size, et cetera. What I wanna be clear about is that any organization may apply for what we call a public programming project, and that's in the arts, humanities, or interpretive sciences. Just a flag here, lots of people say, what the heck is interpretive sciences? We are talking here about organizations or activities that are about interpreting the natural world for the public. So activities in science education for the public, environmental education, we award a lot of grants to watershed alliances, botanical gardens, um, zoos, aquariums, etc. The project that you apply for can be a one-time activity that you've never done before and never plan to do again, or it can be an activity that you're going to do every year. Every year you have a summer education program, you may apply every year for that same summer education program. When we call it a project, what we're saying is that it's a distinct aspect of your activities. So it can be a one-time event, a single production, an exhibition, an educational seminar, or it can be a series of related events, such as a whole lecture series or a series of arts classes. Um, there had previously been a requirement that this could not be the sole activity of an organization. So if your organization only does one thing every year, you do that summer education program, in the past, that would have been a problem. It's no longer an issue. You may apply for the project that you do that is the only thing that you do. So again, this is about how we are trying to open up eligibility. So that's what the public programming looks like. To apply for the capacity building, you have to be fully cultural. So I know the next question is, what the heck does public programming mean? What is public programming? What we're talking about is that project grants 
are for public programming, which is intended to support activities that actively engage the public. Engage the public as participants, as audience, as students, as creators, whatever is a relevant and appropriate issue for your project. The engagement with the public is a purpose of the project. So for everybody who's still wondering what that means, imagine you are a historical society that wants to create signage for a walking tour about the historical issues and opportunities in your community. That's a lovely idea, but if all you've done is create the signage and put it up in the neighborhood, there's no guarantee of public engagement with it. So to become eligible, your organization needs to take that lovely piece that you've done where you've done research and you've created the signs and you've hung the signs. And now the public engagement is that you actually reach out to the community, to the people in your neighborhoods to do public activity, which could be guided walking tours or lecture series about activities or interpretive activities around that, but something where where your communication to the public and your work with the public is focused on their engagement, enjoyment, participation with the thing that you are doing right now. So the creation of a thing, whether it's a smartphone app or a piece of public art or the historical walking tour becomes the jumping off point for you to engage with the public to do this program. And then what is capacity building? Capacity building projects are ones that bring new skills or tools to improve an organization's effectiveness in support of its mission. So I've got a couple of examples here. So this, where the public programming is all about external facing, how you engage with the public, Capacity building is about internal work that is being done to make your organization stronger and more knowledgeable so that you can do your own work better that supports your mission. And it's about bringing in new skills or tools, not work that you're doing on your own and by yourselves. So for example, you could be doing staff training you could bring in a consultant to help you with a strategic plan. You might have bought a new customer relationship manager software and you need training for your whole staff to learn how to use it. You might be looking at doing DEIA training, diversity, equity, inclusion, access training for your staff. And you're looking to bring in a consultant to help you with that. Um, you might want a consultant who's gonna help you develop a fundraising plan or a communications marketing strategy plan or strategic planning. So the focus there is that all of these involve you bringing new knowledge into your organization so that you can become stronger and more capable of supporting the mission that you have. I just want to flag, I, I've said in the, the first description here that tools is part of this, but do note on the guidelines and in the application, there is a budget restriction on how much you can spend on capital purchases for this program. And that's a limit of $1,000 on any one item for capital purchases. Um, so if you're buying software and the software is $10,000 and the training to implement is something else, apply for the training to implement as opposed to the actual software cost. What isn't eligible? Well, first of all, we are the Massachusetts or the Mass Cultural Council. We exist to serve residents of Massachusetts and cultural activity in Massachusetts. So programming outside of Massachusetts is not eligible. If your application is to support, let's say you're a theater and you are touring a production around to three different New England states, then your application should be for the portion of that that is Massachusetts activities. Um, we don't fund fundraising activities. So if you are doing a fundraising auction or you know, a gala, that's not eligible. Like I said before, we will support your organization developing plans through a capacity building grant. You can develop plans for how you are going to do better fundraising, but fundraising such as buying a table at an event, that kind of thing is not something that we support through this program. 
We don't fund capital expenditures. Like I said, if you're putting on a new roof, if you're buying new software, there's a thousand dollar limit on that. We do not fund individual applicants, only organizations. Here's something I've noticed a couple of applicants coming into the pool who are associated with K to 12 educational organizations. Please note that projects that are exclusively by or for students as part of the activities of a school or college are not eligible. Primary purpose of this application has to be for the general public. And if you are one of those schools and you are writing up your description of the project, it's really on you to make it clear through your description of the project that the majority of the purpose of this is for the general public. We don't fund projects by religious groups that are for the purpose of advancing religion. So I know in the past, the, we've had applications from let's say a church that has a public concert series. That concert series might be eligible, but not if the concert series exists for the purpose of advancing the religious purpose. Um, we don't fund re-granting for prizes or scholarships. We are, we are looking to fund your activities, not your activity of giving away the money we've given to you. So when you're looking at the budget, consider that because if your budget requires those re-granting activities in order for you to meet the $2,500 threshold, that could be an eligibility problem for you. So there are published criteria for this grant program and this is all on our website. Um, first of all, we are looking for you to clearly define the project so we know what it is that you are doing. We expect that your project has goals that are clear and that the project is appropriately designed to meet those goals. And I'm gonna go over these questions in a little more depth separately. Both of those elements are 20% of the scoring of this application. We're looking for your organization to show that you have the capacity to complete this project. And we're gonna be looking at your budget information in addition to your response to the narrative question for that. That's a 15% portion of your score. We are looking for your project to have at least one strategy for promoting DEIA, again, that's diversity, equity, inclusion, and access with a specific goal that is measurable, achievable, and appropriate to the project. We're going to give a little preference to organizations that have not received a project grant before. That's 10% of the score. And then finally, if your applicant's mission is primarily focused on people of color or other historically underrepresented and underfunded groups, that's 20% of the score. I'm expecting we'll be awarding about 190 or so grants in this program. There will be organizations that will score very highly and be 100% on every one of these scoring criteria. There are other applications that will be more mixed. And the wonderful thing about this program is that we have the capacity to, fill, to fund a lot of applications. And that means we can fund applications that have really deep engagement with a small number of people or maybe a a not as deep engagement with a very large number of people and everything in between. It's, you'll see that it's really not a one size fits all kind of award. And if you go to our website, there's a PDF that you can open up that shows the FY21 project grants that were awarded. And you can see the really huge range of things that were eligible and were funded. So if you get a grant, we require that you engage in and report on an advocacy activity. And by that, what we mean is we expect you to participate in thanking your legislators, the governor or the Lieutenant Governor's office for their support of Mass Cultural Council. Your words to your elected officials are incredibly valuable for us when we are advocating for our budget for the next year. And what that means in turn is that if we get more money, we're able to support more programs with larger grants. So hugely valuable to us. Um, we've frequently heard from legislators that this has really made them aware 
of the value of cultural activity in the Commonwealth. This is your words to your state representatives, not your federal ones. So it's not about connecting with the president or the senators or representatives in Washington. It's about connecting with the governor, the governor's office, and the legislators in Boston. We expect you to publicly acknowledge Mass Cultural Council in your funding. And you can put that on your website. In this particular example, the photograph I have here, I don't know if you can see it, but they have our lovely logo there on their signage. So we, we guide you in how to do that. And then finally, we expect you to submit a final report for the program. How do we apply? Well, the full guidelines are on our website and I don't expect you to write down the link here on this PowerPoint, but the, you can find us pretty easily if you go to massculturalcouncil.org and then click on organizations, you will see cultural investment portfolio as one of your first options and you'll see projects within that. Um, again, the application due just before midnight on the 16th and then the link for our new application program. That application link is on our website and it's featured in the blog post about this grant program. And I know that a lot of you have already even started that. So this I think will be the startling point for a, a lot of folks. It's a new application system. It's uh, we have engaged with an outside organization called Smart Simple, and they've designed a really comprehensive program for us um, that manages all of our different applications. It's a new system. So the logins that you used last year won't work. It's all new. If in the last couple of weeks you have started an application on behalf of an organization to a local cultural council or to the festivals program, you already have your username and password. If the last time you applied to us was last year, you don't have those. And I'm gonna give you a little information about that, but that, that could be a whole webinar on its own. There are general descriptions of how to do this on the project page of our website. But one thing I really wanna flag for you is that you should add mass cultural underscore no reply at smartsimple.com to your email contacts. That'll make sure that any emails that we send to you through the system get to you and don't show up in your spam folder. This is what the new site looks like. And anybody who ever dealt with our GoSmart system and thought it was 1995 and you were applying to something very, very old, um, we'll notice it already looks better. Um, this is the new system. A couple of things um, over here on the, the left of the screen, it says new to the system, register. You just click on that and you go ahead and register. If you have not applied for a grant before, do that and register and make sure that you apply, that you register as an organization, not as an individual. You are an individual affiliated with an organization. It's the organization that you are registering. If you applied in the past to the Gateway or Projects Grant programs, we've already moved a lot of information into this new system. We imported users and organizations from the past. So you're probably already in there. And what you wanna to do to check that is, instead of doing register, you want to click forgot password. You put in your email address and click forgot password and it will send you um, a temporary password so you can log in and then create your own permanent password. Your username in this new application system is your actual email address. So, you know, bob at gmail.com becomes a username in this new system. Once you log in, and this is me creating a, a profile that I can use so I can see your actual experience as an applicant. Once you log in, this is what you're going to see. You'll see that there are, oh, sorry about that. That there are currently three opportunities that your organization might be eligible for. I just wanna point out that these are 
opportunities that organizations may apply for, but you might realize when you look at them, you are not eligible. So current opportunities would be, for example, the festivals program. If you don't have a festival, you're not going to be eligible for that. Or you would see this program, but if you're a portfolio grantee, you're not eligible. So it doesn't do that really fine tuning of whether or not you're eligible, but it does tell you what programs are currently open that are open to organizations. It also has 329 local cultural councils, which first of all, I think that's amazing. In this case, this is an application that I started on behalf of my pretend organization. And if you look here in the lower left, you can see that it says one in progress. So that's the application I already started. When you come back to an application that you did some work on, but you didn't finish, this is where you would click to continue the application. And once you get into the applications past the eligibility, there is a little eligibility questionnaire. The next thing you will reach is a page that looks like this. This is not the full page, but this is most of the page. Um, what I wanna point out here, right now you can see applicant information. So that's a summary of the applicant information and you can update it. And then each of these mission, project information, project descriptions, promoting DEIA, budget and acknowledgement, each of those is a tab. So as you work on the application, you will go from one tab to the next to complete your application. And each tab is really just that one item. So it's, it's really much more clearly laid out and you'll be able to see what you've done and what you haven't done. So once you get to the questions, this is, this is not the full page, but this is the core part of the page. This is what you'll see. For example, this is a question about your project description. And you'll note it says pro public programming and has a question. And then it has capacity building and has a question. Throughout the application process, each question has both of these options. If you are applying for a public programming grant, you answer the public programming section. If you're applying for capacity building, you respond to that part of it. The questions really parallel each other, but are edited to be appropriate to which type of grant you are applying for. Um, unlike the old GoSmart system, which didn't do spell check, this system does, which is a wonderful improvement. Um, I still think it would benefit you to draft your responses in some sort of word processing software and then to copy it and paste it into the application um, that I think is easier for editing purposes. You don't have to, just, just a piece of advice. Um, so this question is about you giving us a complete description of the proposed project, including all the activities planned. So it's, you know, is it in person? Who's doing it? Is it online? Who's the target audience? Um, 2000 characters, it might not seem a lot, but it, it's sufficient if you are focused in what you're telling us. You don't need to give us an hour by hour detail of the project, but we are looking to know that you are doing a two day public art program on such and such dates. And it is being led by your arts educators and your target audience is senior citizens in your community. And you know, so that kind of detail. One thing I like to encourage folks to do, if you've written something and you're not sure if it's sufficient, hand it to somebody you know who doesn't know what your project is and see if they can understand what you're doing and tell it back to you. Um, I think it's helpful for you to realize that the folks who are reading your application don't necessarily know your organization. So this is where you're giving us enough information for us to understand what you're doing, where you're doing, who you're doing it for. The project goals. So what is the goal of the proposed project? And I'm sure this is a question that makes a whole lot of sense to you if you're doing capacity building grants and maybe isn't as clear to you when you're thinking about your public programming. But what we're looking at is, what's the reason you're doing this? What is it you hope to accomplish? So if you're doing a summer education program, 
I would assume that you are expecting that the participants in that education program are going to acquire particular skills. They're going to get training in something. So what are the skills you expect them to acquire? And how will you know if you have been successful in doing it? And how did you design the program so that you would know that they would have acquired those? So let's say you do a young person residency program with your professional orchestra. The project is the residency program for the young folks. What is it you're expecting them to gain out of the process? What will they have at the end of it that they don't have at the beginning of it? Um, maybe, your, maybe your project is about community engagement. Well then, what, what is community engagement and how do you know that you have accomplished it? Maybe it's about the opportunity for people to perform. And so you are a community theater and you are doing a show because people in your local community are looking for opportunities to be a part of cultural activity. That's a perfectly valid goal. Just explain how it is you're getting there. Organization capacity. So again, in, in the capacity building question, we're asking about, you know, how do we know that you're ready to do this? Why is this a good time for you to do it? And what steps have you taken to identify the need or to prepare for the project? For the public programming, what we're looking to find out is how do we know that your organization has the skills and experience to do this thing? Now, this goes back to an earlier issue in our eligibility where we used to require that you had two years of experience of doing public programming before you could apply for a project grant. And now we're simply saying that you have some history. So that could be that you've done one event and that's okay. So your answer to this would be, our organization has done, and then you can describe your organization's experience in doing this kind of work. Or maybe you've just hired a new person and that new person is the one who comes with experience you can describe the fact that your new project manager has experience doing this. Or if you're an organization that only has done one thing in the past, but it's made up of people who have personal experience, you can describe the personal experience of those project leaders. These could be employees, they could be volunteers, whatever is appropriate for your organization. We're just looking to know who your organization, which is both the, the entity itself, the organization, but it's also the people doing the work. And you can tell us either or both pieces of information there that help our panelists understand what it is you've got going on. Take a moment just to talk about panelists. So all of these applications, all of you are going to write brilliant applications and submit them before the deadline. And then what happens is a panel of reviewers reviews and scores your applications. Mass Cultural Council staff doesn't review them except for eligibility concerns. So we review to make sure that you are eligible and that your application is eligible. And then it gets forwarded to folks who are from cultural organizations all over the Commonwealth, large and small, representing um, a great diversity of experiences and activities. And those are the folks who review and score your applications. So again, just recognize that you might be a CAPE-based organization and one of your reviewers is based in the Berkshires. You want to give enough context for someone who doesn't know your organization to understand what it is you've got going on. Final question that you're going to be you're going to be answering is around diversity, equity, inclusion, and access. And what we are looking for is to make sure that you are doing your best possible work to make your program respond to those values. Um, you could pick. I, I have an example here. For example, you might be working to make your project accessible to people with disabilities. So you would state that as a goal, 
you would state how many folks would be successful for you to, to, to reach. If you simply say, we're going to make it accessible by performing in a space that doesn't have any physical barriers, well, that's a lovely first step. But how do you know that truly is the best way to accomplish the goal that you've set out? Maybe you've been talking to a local senior center or a, an access um, person in your local municipal government. So you're getting best practices and really understanding what makes your location physically accessible. And then you're figuring out how it is you're actually reaching the people who care about this issue or have this issue as a concern. So um, an example from the past, someone was going to make their program accessible to low income folks by making admission free. Well, that's great, but how is it you are telling your community about that? Doing the thing is only one part of, of being effective. You also have to have the strategy for how you're going to get information out to the appropriate audience. Um, a lot of folks are doing some really deep, brilliant work around making sure that their programs um, are more equitable, are reaching more diverse audiences, are inclusive of all members of our communities, and are accessible. And we at Mass Cultural Council see this as a core value. It is part of our strategic plan. We are looking for all of our grantees to also embrace and engage with strong DEIA strategies. I want to put, this is the budget page. Just point out to you again that you are, you're looking at a 13 month period and you're going to provide cash expenses in your budget. Not the, in, you might be the beneficiary of many in-kind contributions to make your project happen, but the budget has to be for cash. What we have here, however, are two things. One, a question about projected income, and you don't need to go in enormous detail, but we want to know how you're going to pay for this in it if your budget is more than the $2,500 that will be awarded through this program. And we'd also like to know if your project is benefiting from in-kind support. It's not a requirement, but it just gives us a better understanding. If you tell us that you're going to do something enormous and ambitious, and your cash budget is $2,500, we are curious about how you are making the rest of that happen. The budget is here. You see this, this sort of teal colored box for project budget. You click on that and it will open up a budget form. So you might get to this page and say, I don't see a place to put in my budget. That's why you need to actually click on the project budget link to put in your budget. And unlike the GoSmart system where you could put in all kinds of incoherent numbers and they wouldn't add up. This program actually will catch that. So um, another reason why we've transitioned to a new online management system, because we are really looking um, for all the ways that the system itself will help you be successful in, in creating and submitting your application. So as I mentioned before, a few pieces of advice type the text into a word processing document and then copy and paste it. It also means if, you know, Lord forbid, if something should go wrong and your computer crashes in the middle of it, of submitting your application, maybe you've still got that information in your Word document and you don't have to recreate it again. Answer the questions completely and specifically and relevantly. Um, you don't need to convince us of the value and the power of arts in your community. We and all of our panelists already know that and are completely in support of it. So don't, don't worry about convincing us that arts education is important. That's a given. Um, and you've got limited characters in this, so make each one count. Again, assume that the panel doesn't know you or your work. So give us enough information to provide context. That includes your, your website, which will be very helpful to us. And I hugely encourage you to proofread um, like I said, this program actually catches typos, but it's still really helpful 
to um, in conveying your best possible information to, to catch the typos and things. Um, so questions, a couple of things. First of all, I really do my very best to be available to you. Send me emails. Emails are the best way to reach me because like so many folks, uh, I am working remotely. Um, I'm also going to be doing office hours. And this is something that we started doing a year ago and I thought it was wonderfully successful. You can sign up for office hours on Zoom and the link for this is all on the projects page of our website. I'll do about an hour each week, an hour and a half. Um, if it's really popular, we can probably add some more. But what we've done in the past is we end up with small groups of folks and everybody gets to listen in because what I discover is frequently people learn from each other's questions or people actually have shared questions. So rather than answering it five times, I can answer it once in one session. Um, the first one will be next Tuesday. So as you, you sign off this evening and let it percolate a little bit, you might decide you've got lots of questions for me and next Tuesday would be a great time to drop in. I'm also doing these at different hours of the day, hoping that we can reach people when um, the time is most convenient for them. And so with that, I have finished my formal presentation and I'm betting that my, my friends Cheyenne and Michael have busily been responding to questions in the Q&A but I'm happy to entertain other questions. Or I have astonished you by answering every question you might possibly have. Hey, Sarah, this is Michael. We, uh, we've answered 36 questions, Goodness. so we've got through quite a bit. Um, and there are no pending questions that are open. So if anybody does have a question that's remaining, um, feel free to use Q&A. Well, you know, it, oh, is there one? Ask and you shall receive. So um, <laughs> question, uh, someone says, I assume each local arts council sets their own criteria for a project grant? They, they really do. So 329 local cultural councils, the structure for their guidelines um, is set through work with Mass Cultural Council, but local cultural councils might have some specific criteria or priorities. That is a separate program. So their criteria and our criteria for this program um, do not necessarily overlap. Uh, did you say an organization has to be 100% cultural to apply for a capacity building grants? So we use the term fully cultural as opposed to 100% cultural. And what we're looking there is for the primary mission to fit our definition of cultural, which again is arts, humanities, and interpretive sciences. And um, the, the primary goal is around access, education, excellence, and diversity or diversity in arts, humanities, interpretive sciences. Um, you may only submit one application to this program. So if you are struggling to decide whether you want to apply for capacity building or for public programming, um, I would consider which one you might be able to fund out of other resources or other funders and submit to us the one that um, maybe is harder to find funding for because we find that a lot of smaller organizations have trouble getting capacity building grants. So you might wanna consider that. If you're doing program, you can only submit one public programming application. And if somehow you sneak by us and submit two, we will consider the first one that you applied for, not the second. And we won't let you have a choice of that. Sarah, the next question is, can an organization apply for two grants, i.e. for something last year and another happening next spring? Yeah, if, if they are both happening in this fiscal year period, plus one month of June 1 of 2021 through June 
of 2022, you may pick one of those, only one and submit one application. Great, and I'm just gonna paraphrase um, another question that's coming in. I think in general, um, there is tension between the word projects and uh -huh. the long-term nature of capacity building. Yep. Um, so there's questions of if it's a staff position that you're applying for capacity building, can it be a permanent position? Um, $2,500 only covers a small portion of staff compensation. Do you, um, does it have to be addressed in your project that there will be other and ongoing costs? I think I'm gonna flip back here through the, so here we are on the capacity building. Again, we are looking at projects that bring in new skills or tools. So I would say that an application that stated that the purpose was staff salaries is not capacity building under this definition and would not be eligible. I think the question is technically for a new hire. So if you create a new position to create capacity, does it have to be a temporary initiative or could you create a permanent position that is partially funded by this project? Program? And I would say again, this is not about um, paying staff salaries. This is, this is bringing in, this is the cost of bringing in new skills or tools to improve the organization. And yes, obviously hiring new people would add new skills, but that is not what we're thinking of here. So not, not a new hire, but, but again, a consultant who is teaching you how to do something, a training for your full staff, um, learning how to use new software, a consultant who maybe is developing a plan for you, those all would be eligible, but, but simply adding to your existing staff, which is hugely valuable, but again, we, we do not see that this is what we're looking to support in this. Sarah, this is Michael. Um, we have a, there's a question. We have a public program series that has one event monthly. We are, are we applying for the entire series, which would end in June, 2022, or just one event? I would say, well, first of all, um, does each month meet the $2,500 minimum? Um, does each month stand alone as a really coherent thing or is the value in this the, the whole, the, the whole series of events? Let's say you have a lecture series and each lecturer is engaged in some particular topic that connects in some thematic way, I would say that the whole lecture series is the thing that's of value. Um, and that identifying that as the thing um, is, is the compelling story. Okay. I sing with a choir. We do three concerts a year. You could say that a season of us is a legitimate project, but you could also say that each concert really stands on its own unrelated to the other concerts. I would say in our example of my choir, we should pick one concert and really tell the story of that one concert and not, not look at all of them together. Folks, I just wanna thank you again for joining us and thank you for your really thoughtful questions. That's really helpful to us as well about maybe where we need to be clearer in our communication. So your participation always adds value. Um, I encourage you to join me for any of those um, office hours and to, um, to reach out with questions. I really want to do the best to help you out. And um, we will, like I said, we recorded this. So that's going to be on our website. And I will also save the slide deck 
and send that out to all of the people who signed up for today. It'll go out as a PDF um, sometime tomorrow. Um, so, Sarah, we do have an app, uh, a question about who reviews the applications. You did say that Mass Cultural Council staff only does an eligibility review, but can you clarify right. after that? Yeah. Um, so, what happens is we identify mostly through our network of existing grantees, um, program staff, executive directors, uh, folks who work in the not-for-profit cultural field. We also make sure that we have folks who have interpretive science backgrounds so that there are panelists who will be reading your applications who have expertise in that area. It will be a mixed group. So it's not a situation where all of the music applications are read by the music panelists. Um, so it'll be a, a mixed group. Um, and they are all typically Massachusetts folks. And they are mostly folks that we have met through our connections with existing operating support grantees, but not 100% so. Um, they are not organizations who have applied for this program. And there's actually, I'm going to say, there is a stipend available for the reviewers. And if you are interested in ever being a reviewer, you can sign up for that. And in fact, it is something that you will see when you log into our new um, smart, simple management system, you will see that you have the option of registering yourself as a potential reviewer. We're gonna ask you to supply your resume or your LinkedIn profile and explain you know, what kinds of things you think you are well qualified to review. But um, honestly, we get a lot of uh, folks suggested to us through these open processes, and that's hugely valuable. Um, the names of the panelists are not public in advance of the application, but they are in our um, minutes for our board, and therefore our, our public information because they are in our board minutes for our annual meeting. I have figured out how to open up. I'm gonna answer one last question and then call it a day because it's almost 10 past. Um, the question about uh, a series that is marketed together as one. Again, I would say that's probably one thing and makes sense to, to submit the application for it as one thing. Um, if you're an organization that does four different film festivals across the year, it might be a stronger story to 